Hi, I'm Dr. T, and I'm a pediatrician. On Ask Dr. T, I answer health questions from teens. Questions ranging from safe sex, to self-love, to questions about body parts. Let's get this episode started. All right, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in our world right now, and I wanted to talk about uh, vaccines, and specifically the COVID vaccine. There are a lot of questions and uncertainties out there um, about how vaccines work, the side effects, safety, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to talk from a medical standpoint about what we know about the vaccines and give you some factual context. Um, I also want to say that I'm a doctor, but I'm also human. And I understand what it feels like to be hesitant or concerned or wonder what the long-term effects of vaccination are. But I did my research and I did my best to apply logic to and history to the current scenario. So just giving you a little disclaimer that I also went through a period of uncertainty, but I have arrived at a place where I I trust what we know about how our bodies work and how to protect ourselves against this horrible virus that is killing millions of people across the world. So um, I hope this helps. So I've broken it down to we're going to just do basically six little components here. So first, how do vaccines in general work? So we have a couple of different types of immune responses. Um, we have the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. And so the innate immune response um, is sort of the first line protection against any foreign pathogen or bad bug that gets into our system. And so usually it's going to be pretty nonspecific though. So if your innate re immune response kicks in, it kicks into anything and everything. Um, and the immune response is going to be, again, uh, pretty big and robust and not tailored to any particular virus, bacteria, or other pathogen. The adaptive immune response is a really cool um, type of immune response that's T cell and B cell mediated. And so we have these specific types of cells that are a part of our immune system that actually have the ability to remember. So if I was exposed to, say, chicken pox, true story, if I had chicken pox when I was younger, my immune system remembers the chicken pox virus, and then the next time I was exposed to it, my adaptive immune response already had been exposed to the vi uh, virus, and so it was able to attack that chicken pox more effectively and efficiently and help keep me safe and protected. So um, that's kind of the idea behind vaccines, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be exposed to the entire bacteria or virus to develop those memory cells. So here's how it works. So let's pretend like this is a very nonspecific bacteria or virus. On each individual bacteria or virus, we have surface particles. So obviously each bacteria and virus is going to be a little bit distinct from the next, but the, the things that we really take advantage of are these unique proteins or markers on the surface of different particles. So for instance, for COVID, we have identified a specific protein on the surface of COVID. It's called a spike protein, um, but a specific type of protein on the surface of COVID that we are using to help our bodies mount an immune response, an adaptive immune response. And so here's how it works. 
For vaccination, again, you don't put the whole molecule in the body. Instead, what we do is we're able to expose the body to just a specific protein that's on the surface of COVID. So this particular spike protein is what is given or shown to our body in the form of vaccines. So when our body sees this, just the spike protein, so it's not COVID itself, only the spike protein, um, our bodies in turn develop an immune response, a memory immune response to that particular protein so that if you are exposed to COVID in the future, our immune system is already prepped and it says, I've seen that spike protein before, let's get it, get it out of here. It helps the body react and take care of, get rid of foreign particles much faster before they can spread to other parts of the body. It says very quickly, I've seen this before, we're gonna take care of it right away. The adaptive immune response is going to be the most efficient and effective and safe response to any foreign particle that comes into our bodies. So just keeping in mind that vaccines for the most part, and specifically for the COVID vaccine, you are not being exposed to COVID itself. You're just being exposed to one marker of the outside of the COVID virus so that if you were to come in contact with COVID, your body would say, I've seen you before, you're a bad guy, let's get him out of here, okay? There are a couple of different major FDA approved specifically for emergency use, but we're in the process of having full approval, um, but a couple of FDA approved different types of uh, va vaccines. And so for the first one, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, benefit, one dose only, pretty cool. Side effects, so what we know so far is that there is a potential for clot development. And so that's what we're gonna talk about now. Number two, clots. Only noted with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, specifically in females under the age of 50. Now, to give you some perspective, there have only been 39 confirmed cases so far of these clots out of 13 million vaccines administered which puts the risk of having a clot from the vaccine at 0.0003%, okay? Also keep in mind that clotting is a reaction to an inflammatory state of our body. And so if you were exposed to COVID, there's also a chance of developing clots. So. The risk of clot development with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, is pretty darn low. The other thing to consider is that the risk is primarily in individuals of female anatomy under the age of 50. So if this is you, maybe go for another vaccine, okay? That, and that will help with the risk reduction as well. Um, all right, the next set of known side effects from the vaccine myocarditis or pericarditis, which is inflammation of the muscle of the heart or the uh, sac that surrounds the heart. Um, this is actually a, an occurrence that we see from a variety of viral illnesses, um, including COVID, um, but also in response specifically to the mRNA vaccine. So that would be the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. Now, again, some perspective for this. So this is primarily gonna be in young, the individuals with male anatomy is where the incidence of this has happened. So um, the mRNA vaccines require two doses. Now the symptoms of myocarditis and pericarditis have primarily been noted after the second dose has been administered. So for your perspective, there have been 699 confirmed cases of myocarditis and pericarditis that have been attributed to the mRNA vaccine out of 328 million doses 
of these vaccines being administered. So again, that puts you at risk anywhere between 0 0.0002 and 0.0004% of the side effect of myocarditis and pericarditis. Also noting that the vast majority of these individuals recovered very quickly without any sort of medical intervention. Um, so this is something that we see outside of the mRNA vaccine. Um, we see it with viral illness, but we again, also see it with COVID. So just keep that perspective as well. There have been other concerns or reports about fertility and changes in menstrual cycle with some of the COVID vaccines. Just, just so you know, there have been zero cases of fertility being impacted from these vaccines. Um, there have been reports of people's period or their menstrual cycle being thrown off a bit, um, which, is, which makes sense. Um, if you are giving someone a vaccine and they mount an immune response, that can cause a little bit of systemic inflammation or stress, which releases cortisol, which can impact your menstrual cycle. So realistically, it's possible, but it does not in any way mean there's going to be a long-term effect on fertility. The other thing I found is that there, have, there was initially a study that um, compared the spike protein sequence to a sequence of a protein that is found on the placental surface. And so what they found was in a very long sequence of amino acids that make up the protein, there were four amino acids that were similar in sequence between the spike protein and the placental protein. So someone extrapolated and made the assumption that the sequence of four amino acids that is somewhat similar between the two groups would mean that there's an immune response to the spike protein and also to placental protein. That has not been validated at all in real life and realistically the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence of these proteins is otherwise significantly remarkably different. So that's also uh, no truth to that argument either. So zero evidence that these impact fertility, but understandable that, that people are concerned, but no evidence out there to support that. Um, so getting to right now, what we're seeing are cases of COVID in individuals who have been vaccinated. So, I hope in describing how vaccines work, it kind of makes sense that it is possible to be exposed to COVID, possibly have COVID be in your system, but still develop an immune response. And that is the point, is that if you were to be exposed, your body is prepared to fight it off. And so having the vaccine doesn't mean that you're not gonna be exposed. Having the vaccine means that your body is prepared to fight it off. And so what we are seeing now is that individuals who are exposed to COVID have significantly better outcomes than those who have not been vaccinated. Um, so if you've been vaccinated, your immune system is already prepared to fight off COVID. So if you were to catch COVID, your body should react appropriately and keep you safe. Just because people are catching COVID because they, when they've been vaccinated, uh, doesn't mean that the vaccine is ineffective. The whole point of the vaccine is to be more effective at fighting off the virus, which we know it does. The other thing we know about the vaccine is that it is very efficient at reducing transmission from person to person. So if you're unvaccinated, the chance of you passing on the virus is much higher than if you are vaccinated. So vaccination protects you against a severe COVID infection, and it also protects others by reducing the risk of you transmitting COVID to other people. The other thing to know is that no vaccine is none of the vaccines that we have. It, um, are 100% effective, meaning for 
the vast majority of people, you will develop a memory immune response. But there are a small portion of individuals who get vaccinated and the vaccine won't work. Um, it won't develop that long-term memory response. And so if they were exposed, there's a possibility that they could have a more severe outcome because their body didn't mount that immune response to the vaccine. This is why it is so important for as many people as possible to get the vaccine. The more people we have who are vaccinated, the more we can protect those individuals who maybe didn't develop an immune response, maybe can't get vaccinated because of their immune system itself. So maybe someone has cancer or maybe someone has diabetes and their body isn't great at developing an immune response. And so the more people we get vaccinated and reduce the transmission of the virus, the more effective we are going to be at protecting those who either can't get vaccinated or the vaccine doesn't totally work. All right, so let's say you've decided you want to get the vaccine. What can you expect? So um, I already talked about a couple of the contraindications for specific age groups. So I would say again, um, if you are a, an individual of female anatomy under the age of 50, I would probably not get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that means that you would get the mRNA vaccine, which means that you need two doses. Okay, so that is one thing to expect is that if you go in for the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, you will be getting two doses. It should be delivered in your arm. And everyone has a variety of different reactions. Some people say they barely feel it at all. They feel well afterwards. Other people say their arms are very sore. Some people develop almost a, a sign that their immune system is turned on, meaning that they have low-grade fevers, they feel kind of crummy for 24 hours. So it's kind of a spectrum from nothing to feeling crummy for 24 hours. Um, and that would be your expectation. If you were to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you only need one dose. Um, but just know that it's a shot, so it will be painful for some people. Some people say it doesn't hurt at all. I personally had a pretty sore arm both times I got it for about five days or so. So I would say if you're going for like a baseball tournament or basketball, or if you're planning some endurance activity or competition, maybe wait till after. But, um, but that's what you can expect is you might have nothing or you might feel crummy for 24 hours. But all of those are within the realm of possibility. If you do make the decision to get vaccinated, know that you are making a great step in protecting your body and protecting those around you. So I hope this has helped. And if you have any other questions, um, please let me know in the comment section or on my website, and I'll try to address them in future videos or in questions through my website. And remember, if you have a question for Ask Dr. T, you can either respond in this video or submit through my website, askdrt.net.